Hey there, and welcome to Morning Brews Business Casual, the podcast that always follows the money. I'm Kinsey Grant, your host and brew business editor. Let's get into it. So you recently read in Morning Brew that U.S. venture capitalists are expected to put over $100 billion into startups for the second straight year in 2019. Through the third quarter alone, venture capital firms poured in nearly $97 billion worth of funding in 7,862 deals. Those are obviously big, staggering numbers, but they come at a time when sky-high startup valuations are really under the microscope, and that's putting it lightly. So with hordes of venture capital firms chasing unicorns, which have kind of themselves become the startup norm, how are investors at every stage of the venture story shifting strategy? Today, to help me understand that, plus why all the money is flowing in the first place, Ben Sun, co-founder and general partner at New York-based venture capital firm Primary Venture Partners. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. We're really excited to, uh, to dive into this very complicated topic. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mentioned you're in VC now, but you've been kind of something of a, a serial entrepreneur. Would you say that's a fair characterization? Definitely, yeah. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> so I'll, I'll run through some of the highlights here. Co-founder of Launch Time, co-founder of one of the first social networking companies, yeah. uh, Community Connect. And that story is, is pretty cool. It started in 1996 or so. It did, yeah. Uh, early. I think, yeah, what Mark Zuckerberg was what, like 12 years old at that time? Maybe younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by 2008, you guys got acquired by Radio One, but in the in-between raised over $20 million, had some really cool investors as well. Uh, But now that you're in venture capital, you've invested in first rounds of some pretty impressive companies, one of them, Jet.com. Yeah. Uh, You you know, we all know Walmart bought Jet.com for $3.3 billion. Also, Coupang? Coupang. Coupang. Yeah. Wanted to make sure I got it right. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Which I've heard is, people say it's the Amazon of Coupang. Yeah, it is. (laughs) I would say it is. Okay. That's awesome. Um, But now you you kind of are more focused on consumer-facing companies, or is this still across the board? Uh, I focus mostly on consumer. I've done okay. a little bit of B2B. Um, and now Primary is really focused on New York. So even being involved in Coupon, where I met the entrepreneur here in New York and um, and backed him when he went to Korea. Okay. Um, everything else we've done is pretty much based here. Okay. And you also went to University of Michigan? I did. So I feel compelled as a, a brew employee to say go blue. Go blue, um, nice. You're a big, a big Michigan company. I heard. Uh, <laughs> so... Let's let's kind of get started here. I, I want to establish a little bit of baseline understanding for some people because venture capital, we hear the words a lot, but it might not necessarily be totally clear what all these words mean. So I'm going to give you a couple words. Give me the shortest definition you can conjure up if okay. possible. So uh, broadest sense, venture capital, heretofore VC for the rest of the interview. Yep. How would you define it? Um, it's usually um, uh, capital for... Um, High growth startups, um, and that can range from early stage being something like pre seed or seed, as they call it, mm-hmm. to uh, growth or late stage. Um, but these these are usually still fast growing and usually not profitable businesses, okay. um, and that's why they require a different type of risky capital. So you brought up my next question: yeah. seed stage. How would you sure. define that? Well, that's uh, constantly being defined. Um, I would say it's. Now, um, on more like round size, I think it's anywhere from like 2 million to 5 million is considered like the range for seed. Um, before seed was almost like a couple hundred thousand dollars to maybe up to 2 million, and that's kind of moved up. And now people are categorizing pre seed um, as like a couple hundred thousand dollars to maybe a million and a half to 2 million. Are so, these kind of arbitrary definitions? Like, pretty is much. There, is there anybody who's dictating this is a seed? No, seed that, it's, a, it's a great question. I think, you know, they, the, the invention of seed rounds really came about when it was primarily angel investors were funding these early stage startups before okay. they raised their Series A. And ra- raising a Series A in the early days of venture capital were more like at least 3 million and more like 5 million. And so a lot of the times it was like, uh, you know, angel investors, like individuals coming in and giving the initial amount of capital until that Series A. Um, And when that early round got institutionalized, meaning there were funds that were going to go after what these early rounds of angels were going after, I think that was when the definition of seed came around. Um, As those seed funds have gotten bigger, um, meaning that, you know, in the early days it might have been a $5 million seed fund or a $10 million seed fund, now you're seeing... $100, $200, $300 Hundred, two hundred, three hundred million dollars seed funds. Okay, um, and therefore, I think they're willing to give early capital, um, early companies bigger checks. Okay, yeah. and I want to jump more into the 
the early part of this conversation, sure. but quickly before we move on. Last definition, an exit. Uh, exit is usually tied to two ways. It's usually through um, M&A or mergers and acquisitions. So a company gets acquired um, or the company goes public. Okay. So like I mentioned, I want to get into the, the aspect of early stage investing here. Primary is primarily focused on early stage investments, yes? It is, seed stage in New York City. So what drew you to that specific point in the lifetime of a company? A uh, bunch of reasons. I mean, I think having been an entrepreneur in the past, um, you know, my heart was in early stage startups after I ran my company for 12 years and decided to do this. And the reason why is that, like, you know, my, um, my company got to the Community Connect, my first startup, got to about 150 people, employees. Um, so, you know, fairly small still. It wasn't like a huge business. But, like, looking uh, back on that, like, 12-year journey, I would say that the most fun days were the early days. And I, I tell people, like, zero to 20 employees, it was like a family. Right. 20 to 50 people, it was like a tribe. And then 50 people plus, especially 100 people plus, it became an organization. Mm-hmm. And it was just such an amazing vibe on, like, when we were a family in a, or a tribe. And when it became an organization, it became a little bit less interesting and exciting. It was just the energy, the world of possibilities at the early stage, how dynamic it is at that really early phase, um, how much you can, like, shape and, like, and change the course of it in a relatively short amount of time. Um, uh, all of that was just the stuff that, like, I really loved and craved. And I said, well, how can I get more of that? And unfortunately, being a CEO, you eventually have to grow out of that if you continue to be successful. And I said, but as an investor, I can help those entrepreneurs in that early part of their journey be involved in it. And I think I'd enjoy the work because I I love family and tribes. Right. So there's a lot of magic to be captured there. And there's obviously a lot of possibilities. And it's a a really great kind of vibe going on. But as an investor, that's got to be tough as well. I think that you know, it could you could argue you need a lot more hand-holding in the early stages of your company. You're not just pouring in money, stroking a check, and walking away. You're often joining a board or becoming an advisor in some form. What's that process been like for you? That process has been great. I mean, I really have enjoyed it. I mean, it's definitely a new challenge. Um, uh, you know, being an investor, um, you know, a lot of the reasons why I became an investor was because— um, I actually didn't feel like I got very much help from my own investors or VCs. Okay, interesting. Um, I often felt like they were spread too thin. They never really kind of dove deep enough in the business. And I don't think they really kind of understood my business a lot of the times. Um, And if you ask entrepreneurs, you'd probably hear that very often. Um, I think Vinod Kosla, who's a pretty known VC, I think he said publicly at a TechCrunch Disrupt uh, conference, I think he said that, uh, 70% of VCs are, um, are like zero value and mm-hmm. probably most of those people are negative value. <laughs> so, um, so it's fairly been the norm. And a lot of it, I think, is because um, how it's been approached in a lot of ways. And I really wanted to take on the challenge of like, okay, how can we change that? How can we do early stage venture, but actually be more helpful, be a bit deeper? Uh, And that, to me, was, like, the interesting part about the challenge. Does that limit how many investments you can make as a firm? You definitely start there. Um, So, you know, what we saw, especially in seed investing, was that there was a lot of what we call, like, spray and pray. Um, So you see firms doing, like, a deal a week. Um, And a lot of Genesis started with, you know, um, know, pretty famous angels like Ron Conway, who— you know, started SV Angel and was involved in a lot of great companies, including Facebook. But it was a very, like, high-volume game, hoping for a lottery ticket. And when you're doing an investment a week, right, like, you can barely name the companies that you're in. Yeah, that's got to be exhausting. It's it's probably exhausting, but, you know, I get a strategy. It's it's no longer—it's, you know, a lot of them think that they're almost creating, like, an index fund of all these startups. So— um, and when you become known as like easy money, a lot of it, you know, entrepreneurs will go to you. Um, so that was a lot of the strategy from the more kind of high volume players. Uh, and then, but what was missing was, okay, who actually does fewer deals and, you know, probably writes bigger checks alongside that though. Um, but that concentration of less companies says, oh, I get to go deeper and I get to try to be more involved. And so that's step one. And step two is like, how do you build a team? to actually provide more support. So it just shouldn't be me as an investor to say I'm going to help because I'm just one person, also spread across multiple companies. 
But then how do we layer in a team that bring in operating experience that are even better at things that I'm, I'm not able to do? Well, Because you got to remember, these seed stage companies, they're like five people going to 12, right? If you're five going to 12, like you're not hiring like in a recruiting team. Right, yeah. <laughs> Instead, we have three people in talent and recruiting alone, and all we do is focus on New York City. Right. So if we're going out meeting with people, we say, well, this is a great engineer. Um, he's looking at his next opportunity. Um, he might not be a fit for company one, but he may be a fit for company two, three, four, five. Okay. So it actually gives us a lot of leverage by being focused in New York and having this team that goes out and like builds these deep networks. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even think about at Morning Brew in the early days, we have producer Josh who produces this podcast. We always joke that he was also HR and he also <laughs> is our product manager. And now he's strategy and ops. Like it's, you really do have to think about what's the next priority that we need in terms of growing from I was number five on the team, now we're going to be close to 30 by the end of the year. That's awesome, but it's also really, really hard. You have to prioritize. 100%. I mean, as you know, in that early part, you're a jack of all trades, master of none, Mm -hmm. and that's necessary. One thing that we do know, though, at a company even like Morning Brew, um, there's a war for great talent. And as an unknown startup, it's like really hard to go and find that and have the time and resources and capabilities to go do that. And if we can have a team of like professionals that have done it in their careers, all focus on that and give you a leg up, um, it's a huge advantage. Because as you know, it's like in the early phases of that company, that one star, you know, those couple star people that you hire initially has, has such an impact on the business. Okay. I want to also talk about this from the perspective of the company. You know, when you are raising money, you kind of effectively become up against the clock. You have to reach certain financial milestones, uh, yeah. you know, any number of, of different multiples or, or margins or whatever the yeah. the fund is, is holding you to in a certain amount of time. And there are a lot of different factors involved with that as well from the fund's perspective, whether that's the lifetime of the fund or any number of other, other things. When does it make sense for a company to say, hey, let's raise a seed round or let's do a series A uh, instead of saying, let's try and bootstrap this? That's a great question. I mean, I would say some companies to build just, you just can't bootstrap. Um, Mm -hmm. There's sometimes more capital intensive. Um, A lot of times you also run the risk of like, hey, if you go the bootstrap route, it may take you a lot more years to get there. And some competitor that actually goes and raise money is going to get there a lot faster and you're going to miss the opportunity. Um, so there's a lot of questions, you know, that you kind of have to answer in that strategy. I would say as a function of, can you go it, can you go alone and bootstrap it? I'd say is question one. And number two is, should you just given that like, Hey, is this opportunity going to go away? And will you be able to deliver on that kind of value and that vision that you're trying to set for if you don't raise money? So that's number one on like, should you take capital and should you venture capital initially in terms of the timing of it? It's all, it, it really like it's all over the place in seed. Um, we've backed, you know, two people with a, an idea and sketched on a you know piece of paper, like not even like a formal presentation. I feel like that's like what you read in the movies. Right? Yeah, <laughs> or you see in the and, movies. and it does happen because there's certain like you know at, at seed stage in our belief and and a lot of people believe this is that it's really about betting on people. Um, I'd say some of the best companies I've been involved in, what they started as and what they ended up as, become very very different. Um, so, you know, Coupang out in Korea, bomb started it, um, amazing entrepreneur. But it started more as a daily deal flash sale business. Um, so kind of Groupon meets, you know, Zulily or Gilt. Um, and now it's an Amazon business. And it really is an Amazon play. And the whole deal business is basically gone. And so the one common thread in that journey was the founder CEO. Okay. Like, if, if you meet him, he's... He's uh he's he's like he's incredible. Like How did you meet him? I met him actually playing uh, pickup basketball and <laughs> awesome. and uh, he's very competitive in basketball. Uh Who won that basketball game? Uh I did when I was younger and he'll admit to that, but you know, he he's very competitive. Okay. <laughs> he definitely doesn't like losing. Okay. Um That's a, a good characteristic of an entrepreneur. Good <laughs> very he definitely doesn't like losing. He definitely I wouldn't bet against him. So bomb, you know, you can tell like um is that type of entrepreneur. Like, it's like we often ask, would you bet against that person? And that's also, that's a, that's a great way to think of it okay. uh, in our view. And so you're like, okay, will this person figure it out? And do they have the drive and smarts and, you know, abilities to go and do this? Okay. You started in, like I mentioned earlier, an internet company in 1996, which 
I was young then, I'll admit, (laughs) but even then there were still some questions about, is this whole idea of the internet going to be viable in a decade? Um, And we obviously have gotten the answer in spades now. (laughs) We know the answer is yes, but you have, it it seems, a great eye for trends. And this trend spotting capacity is really, really important when it comes to choosing a company to which you are going to funnel money. How do you uh, deploy that in in the best way possible? How do you try and spot the trends and make sure that you're following the right ones and and not falling for the traps of some of the other big trends? That's a a great question. Um, I think you inherently as, uh, I'm I'm very intellectually curious about stuff, especially about like, consumer behavior. Um, And so even the startup that I started, um, it was an early social networking company, so years before Facebook and even MySpace. And, you know, there was really nothing else around. And, um, but the one thing that was around back then was AOL, when AOL was just like, hey, these just ship you this CD, and you have to load it up, and you have to dial in. You had it it in the rec room. You had it in the rec room, room. there you go. That's right. (laughs) There you go, you have these flashbacks. And, but it was like a wall garden, not a web service. But the most popular things in AOL, if you remember, were instant messenger, chat rooms, message boards. It was all about community, right? right. And that's what like made AOL popular and successful. And when the web came around, you were like, wow, none of that stuff is on the web. And why should it be in this walled AOL garden? And that was the really thesis about, hey, how do I bring communities online? Okay. But, you know, spotting those trends of like, hey, what am, I, what am I seeing in real life? And then merging that with these kind of transformational shifts of like consumer behavior and being able to marry those two is like the really fun part about the job. And I think, you know, what, a, what it enables you to do that, it just requires like a ton of intellectual curiosity. Okay. So it's not necessarily rocket science. It's being intellectually curious and noticing the things that are around you. Oh, yeah. I don't think whatever we do is... Uh, rocket science at all. I think it's merging those kind of like those patterns together, number one, and number two, especially for early stage venture, is you're just nose for great talent. Okay. I want to pivot for a second here to talk about how you guys raise money as a, a, a firm. Sure, yeah. Um, it's not like this money just appears out of nowhere. You have to raise money as well to invest in other companies. You guys recently uh, raised a $100 million second fund last year, I believe. Yes. Uh, how was that process for you? Uh, it was good. I mean, I'd say the first fund is usually the hardest. And okay. our first fund was raised in the beginning of 2015. It was a $60 yeah, million dollar fund. smaller. Um, luckily, you know, I founded, I co-founded the firm with my partner, uh, Brad Sverluga. Brian and I were friends. He'd been a career VC and he had a, a very good track record. And I'd say those are the big things is track record and reputation. Okay. Um, and so when we went and stood up our first fund, I think having those previous relationships with LPs that my, my, my partner had, as well as um, some track record and reputation, whether it be personally or my, my partner through um, his previous funds, allowed us to like raise that, that first fund. I wouldn't say it was easy because as a new partnership, you know, people are still nervous. They're like, hey, this is a marriage. And in reality, 50% of marriages get divorced. Divorce. Right. Um, and then it's, it's no different than, you know, um, starting a venture fund where you're probably spending more time than your spouse. So <laughs> they're like, well, like, are you going to say what you're going to do? And are you guys going to be around and get together? Are, and are you, you never going to go to bed angry? That's right. All of that. And so, you know, they want to see that. So I have to say the the first guy said, okay, we want to be along this ride. We believe in you guys. Um, the second one, they said, okay, how are you guys doing? And luckily we were doing really well. And they saw that, you know, yeah, my partner and I weren't going to bed angry. And <laughs> they said, okay, we're in, we're in for it again. Okay. Um, or we got some new investors that said, okay, now we're ready. Um, Would you say that a hundred million dollars is what size, relatively speaking? Is that large? Is it? It's, I'd say it's on the long, larger end of seed funds. Okay. Um, um, I think anytime you cross like a hundred, right now, it's getting pretty big. But I'd say it's they're they're creeping up even larger and larger these days. Okay. So you know, uh, a fund like you know first round capital, I think they're at like one hundred eighty million. Um, True Ventures out in the West Coast, they have a $300 million seed fund. It's probably the largest that I know of. Um, So they definitely get larger. Um, uh, But I'd say your average seed fund is probably close to like 30 to 50. So for you guys with $100 how long does that last you? 